Welcome back to Principles and Practice. I'm your host, Chris Heslip, and this week I am glad to be welcoming back Blue Van Dyke for our special double feature part two, focusing on individual goal settings. We talked last week with Blue about strategic planning, and we are glad to have him back on the show this week. Blue is a global businessman and strategic advisor with a history of success. Recently, he was the executive pastor of Christ Church of the Valley in Arizona. We're glad to welcome him today and hear how he implements individual goal setting across his organizations. We're going to be diving into talking about questions about goal setting that you've been asking as Blue answers actual questions submitted by you, the audience. Also, listen to the end to hear Blue's approach to keeping a balanced scorecard at work and for his life. Now, let's welcome Blue to the show. All right, well, welcome back to our special part two uh, on goal setting today with Blue Van Dyke. Blue, it's great to have you back again. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks, Chris. It's been great. Well, last week we talked all about strategic planning. I mean, really goal setting at the organization level. And today we want to dive into how that translates to goal setting at the individual level. So yeah. uh, give us a quick recap of what we talked about last time, strategic planning, and then how do yeah. we get individual goals out of that process? Yeah, so, you know, it's just part of a big recap is I think there's so many different definitions for planning. People call a whole bunch of things planning. I've sort of narrowed it down into these four groups of, of this idea that you have visionary planning. That's looking five years out, where are we heading? Five years plus, I kind of call it. And and then you have what I'll call strategic or operational planning. That's sort of that three to five year plan, annual planning, which is what are we going to do in the course of these 12 months, whether it's a January to December or whatever your fiscal year might be, but what is this annual plan going to look like? And then the last one I call just tactical planning. We have a project. We want to launch a new website or do something similar to that. So it's very specific in budget and time constraint. So most of what we focused on was that idea of the annual planning process, right? What is the value and where does it does it bring value with regards to annual planning? And for me, there's sort of these five primary reasons why I've used annual planning as a part of my leadership forever, right? I was indoctrinated. It was one, it just really helps to set priorities for the organization. This is what is important at the highest level of the organization down. It helps set direction. This is where we want to go. We've got 12 months and this is where we want to head from here to some preferred future there, right? It simplifies for me also decision-making the best tool to allow people in the organization that are a little bit lower in the hierarchy to be able to make decisions without having to go back up the ladder to get confirmation along those things. So it's really this direction decision. Um, The biggest for me, probably the most important is this idea of alignment, that by setting goals, what we're trying to do is we're aligning the energy and focusing all of that collective energy and resources in the same direction to make sure we're all rowing. It's the old analogy, right? Are we all rowing in the same direction in the boat um, in these areas? And then the last one is to communicate, you know, what's important to us and or motivate our staff with what's important to us. So those are kind of the five main areas of, of annual planning or why we do annual planning. And for me, it's, you know, the, the concept of the rollout, the, the methodology to go about doing it. I consider, you know, this idea of strategic planning to be a very top down driven initiative. So senior leaders sort of set this idea of what are the top initiatives? And then that ripples down in a, in a waterfall effect down to departments and ministries so that they can set objectives that are aligned with the initiatives. And then to your point kind of today, how do individuals play in that? What's the next roll down piece of how do individuals set their goals that are aligned to the two above them? Uh, but that's, that's sort of what we covered last week was to get to this place today on individuals. Fantastic. And then it, it seems like it would be straightforward to take, you know, that annual plan and, and translate that into an individual goal. Um, <laughs> Does, you, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And so jump in with like, how often should we set goals? Should we, should I have an individual goal for a year, for a quarter? Right. You know, how do you, how do you go about translating that? Yeah, that's a good call. And, and maybe just as even a little bit of a precursor, I'll talk about the types of individual goals right now. I think there are a hundred different ideas around goal setting. What I'm talking about very specifically are the individual goals with regards to this annual planning process, right? I think, and just, you know, on a tangent a little bit, I have personal goals that I set with my family, right? And I sit down and I do this and, 
as crazy as the the format or the methodology I use is something called the balance scorecard. Well, I created something called the balance scorecard for life, my personal one. So I have my corporate goals that I do through this process to make sure they align the direction of the organization. And then my family and I get together and we do our own personal scorecard. So it sounds a little over the top, but that's just, and it's funny because my kids can sit here and, and articulate the three elements of a balanced scorecard and the areas that we're doing. And, uh, but I'm an Excel guy and a, and a goal driven guy. So, so anyways, but for today, the pieces that we're really talking about are those goals that we're setting with regards to the annual planning within the organization, right? So I think of having two separate goals for individuals, two buckets of goals, right? And one of those are what I call alignment goals and then development goals. So alignment goals are, hey, as I look at my ministry or my department's you know, objectives, and those should be aligned to my executive leadership initiatives, how do I align my goals to fill that, right? What am I gonna do to fall in line with that? And then I have these developmental goals. And I think that's also important to say within my specific role, within you know, my specific stage professionally, where do I need to develop? Where do I need to evolve so that I can be a more effective in helping the organization reach their goals? So we always encouraged our employees to have two buckets of goals as they look at this, alignment goals and developmental goals. Right? And, and the key is like, what are some tricks? If I were to say there were kind of two fundamental areas to look at, one is keep them small, keep them short, right? Don't have a list that's exhaustive of goals. Uh, you'll probably get, you know, ask 10 people, you get 10 answers. I think six to seven goals in total is very manageable. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that I go through quite a bit is how do you set those goals? And there's different philosophies in setting those goals, whether you use sort of a smarter methodology or something of that. But at the end of the day, don't have them exhaustive and make sure that they follow a certain principle like smarter when setting those out. I love that. One of the questions we actually got here, let yep. me find this, was... Uh, how do you go, where, where do you store those goals? Is there a particular system? Do you write them down? Yeah, uh, so this is uh, JD from Lubbock here. He says, what's the best system for goal planning? Uh, Traction EOS or Michael Hyatt's full focus planner? Is there yeah. some particular approach that you've seen that works in terms of, yeah. okay, I've got these, now what do I do with them? Yeah, great call. And I think that, you know, good old consulting answer, it depends. Depends how much money you want to spend. Depends how detailed you can get into your are. What I would do is I would pick a methodology. And I've heard those and Hyatt's got a great methodology and it comes with a set of tools. That's part of the reason why I chose the balance scorecard as a group of, you know, sort of methodology on setting tools because there's a lot of software that's actually been written to help you track these goals. So there are several vendors. Um, honestly, I can't even count them. I bet you there's 30 or 40 different vendors. We chose a vendor that had a software program that followed the balance scorecard methodology. So literally as I entered in our executive goals, they would funnel down and pre-populate for the directors to enter in their objectives. And that would pre-populate a form, which was a web-based form that somebody would go in and fill. And I think it's a great way to keep it organized, to keep it structured, to make it easy to review. But I will tell you year one, we used Excel spreadsheets. Right. And I could I could pull one up or I'll send it to you in another time. But literally, it was an Excel that showed the initiative. It let the guys type in their objective and the reviews. And then what we would ask is just through the review process, just bring that Excel spreadsheet with you. Right. Uh, the one that I use with my family, that balance scorecard for life. We just do it on Excel. We really do. So my my guess, the way I'm trying to say is there you can get as sophisticated as you want and you can get as less. I think having a tool set, a structure by which to follow it is important. And one that your organization will actually use is probably most important, right? Don't put in something that nobody understands. Nobody's going to go back to that doesn't do you any good. There's no magic in that. Find the thing that you're sure that your system, that your uh, people will actually work. Well, that's actually another one of our uh, audience questions here came in. Uh, Matt from Texas said, how do you keep goals front of mind for employees? And, and yeah. you know, how many checkpoints or indicators do you kind of put in place to kind of check in on that? Yeah, that's great. So our basic philosophy that we follow is this thing, which is plan, do, check, and act. That's sort of our follow-up. So we're going to do the planning. We usually do that planning, the initial planning once a year. Right? And so our rhythm was we would sit together in October and we would develop our annual initiatives. I would roll those first out with my director, that next band that's going to do their objectives, gave them some, their, some time to put their, their head around that. Then come January, we would do our plan phase, right? And this was where we would take one of our staff development days. This is where once a month, the entire staff comes together. 
we would take that day and we'd introduce to them this year's um, you know, initiatives that are coming out from the executive level. We then did a breakout session. So literally picture everybody in a big room, 400 staff members, here's what we're doing from our initiatives. They would then leave and go off into breakout sessions with their director or, or their pastor of the campus. They would roll out their objectives and get a little bit of input. And then for the next three weeks, the individuals would work on their individual plans. They would meet regularly with their director, with their boss to create the planning process. And then what we said is we want you to follow up at a minimum monthly with regards to those plans. So once a month at a minimum, the individual would come in and they would sit down together. And that was that check area, right? Plan do is you start working on them and then you check up on it once a month. And then if you need to make adjustments, it gives you time throughout the year to do that act. What do I need to change? You know, I've got more information now that we're six months into the year than I did at the beginning. Do I need to make any adjustments? So plan it once a year at the very beginning, work on it regularly across the board, check it at a minimum, we say monthly. Um, I would say that some people have weekly staff meetings with their, with their employees. So that rhythm's up to you, but I'd say frequently uh, and then adjust it as necessary, right? But I would not make it this end of year, we'll create them and then we'll wait 12 months and see how we did by the end of the year. Gives you no time to actually act on it, right? So. I love it. One of the questions that comes out of that is, you know, a yeah. uh, question from Michael. Uh, he says, do you recommend a specific percentage of goals that should be hit? In other words, is there a healthy miss rate? You know, how do you stop people yeah. sandbagging uh, and yeah. setting goals that are too easy? Um, yeah. Any ideas on that? I mean, that you know, what if someone just misses their goals? Is that a performance conversation? Like, how, how do you kind of engage in, in that yeah. goal setting and then the behavior to kind of follow up and, and address behavioral issues? Yeah, you know, part of this that I, that I say is it's going to really be dependent upon you as a leader and the culture of your organization. One of my philosophies is that organizations that are successful, I look for two sort of unwritten cultural elements. I think I mentioned this even last time, but one of them is your grittiness. Like just what's the fortitude of this to go out and get stuff done as we need to. The other is innovation. So because I value innovation, I ask people to be innovative and stretch a little bit and push a little bit. I think it's healthy for an organization. I think it's also healthy for individuals. Nobody likes goals that are mundane, boring, and easy to hit. We want something that'll stretch. So if we're going to ask people to be innovative and stretch a little bit, I think it's unrealistic to say you're going to hit 100% of your goals. In fact, you know, this, is, this goes to a little bit deeper philosophy. I, I think hitting the goals is somewhat important. Having something to strive towards is more important. The idea of a clarity of the goal and the direction that we're heading, and we ultimately want to hit it, there's no doubt. But it's the energy we put towards. You're going to get value throughout it. So this is just a blue you know, blueism, I'll call it one of those things is that I think about 85% goal hitting is a good number for me. Anything higher than that, I feel like we sandbag, we didn't stretch enough. Anything yeah. lower says we set too lofty of goals and it has the risk of becoming demoralizing for people who are never hitting them. So for me, 80 to 85% of hitting my goals by the end of the year seems to be a good metric. But I will tell you, as far as looking at the employee, not hitting their goal is not a determinant. But it is not working on your goal, not focusing on it, not aligning the energy to it. Those are conversations, tough conversations we're going to have with individuals. But hey, I went for it, gave me something to wrestle. I ideated with you and other team members about how we're going to get to it. We came up with new ideas because of it. All of that is the win that we're looking for, not necessarily the end result. I love that. That's such, that's such good advice right there. Um, have you got, tell us some stories, you know, where have you seen this done well, where an employee said, Hey, you know, thank you for setting a goal and, and kind of helping me achieve it. And then on the flip side of the coin, have you seen a situation where you set some goals and the employee potentially was just unfocused and didn't achieve them? Yeah. yeah and, and maybe that's even a, a good story is I was talking with some individuals who, um, they went quite a ways down a path on a goal that they set that wasn't aligned to the organization that ended up getting scrapped, right? So one of those is at, at one of, you know, at the church we were at, one of the areas that we had was a, um, uh, what's called a residency program. It was really kind of how we pour into young pastors when they've come out of grad school to prepare them for this. And, and because they hadn't had a lot of conversation in this, they started going down a direction of where we wanted to head the residency. And then as we started rolling out the goals and making this part of what we do as an organization, we found that the direction they were heading in wasn't necessarily aligned with where the church was heading. And there was a high degree of frustration because it wasn't that it was wrong. 
And it wasn't that they weren't even making progress. It's just we ended up shutting it down because it wasn't aligned to where we were. And it had the risk of becoming really demoralizing, right? So they set their own goals, but it wasn't in collaboration with the rest of the organization. And it really sort of had a little bit of a negative impact on morale for sure in that area. So that's one where I say, you know, it's not as if people, because we all have talented individuals without a structured goal setting program. It's not as if they're all just sitting around. It's just if they're intelligent people, they're going to come up with their own ideas about where to go. Um, you know, and our senior pastor, as a result of this, I loved it. He did this exercise where he threw a rope out, had us all stand in a circle and just kind of put a rope that we all grabbed onto and had everybody pull in a different direction, right? We never moved. Nothing happened. We just got stagnant in this area. And that was the metaphor for what was happening when we set goals in different direction. People were pulling really hard. We just at times were really even pulling against ourselves, right? So having a structured thing was, was really one of it. When we aligned people, this was, this is one of the enjoyable ones for me is we have a, we had a sort of an internal marketing department that was within our church and they always felt a little bit like they were a support service rather than a driver for the church. And we came up with our goals, the initiatives, and then the objectives. And some of those were like, Hey, I'm, uh, we want to decrease operating expense by X percent. We want to, one of ours was to keep our labor rate at a certain percent. Um, openly as a church, we set a goal of 35%. So labor as a percent of revenue or giving was at 35%. Um, and what happened was it, it, because we looked at these guys and we said, Hey, here's what we need to reduce that by to hit that 35% number. It allowed them to go out and find a bunch of volunteers, right. And bring these volunteers into a marketing department. And I don't know why we hadn't gone there before. We thought we had to hire for all of these roles, but all of a sudden they then self-initiated this idea that hey, volunteers aren't limited to the weekend. We can bring people in on Tuesday to work in this area. There's talented people. We were able to go out and find them. But that was one area where all of a sudden, not just were we more effective, not did we just hit the goal, but they elevated from this support role to sort of this participant role and had this really cool motivating effect for them. Love that. That's so good. And it also helps them use their giftings in a way that they couldn't, you know, potentially if they're just working on the yeah. church car park roster. You're right. You know, it was neat. And then when they went to these volunteers and they said to them, hey, listen, we're going to ask you to actually do the thing that you're good at, but bring it to the church. These volunteers all of a sudden felt like, wow, this is real value add. This isn't, I'm not checking my tool belt at the door. It's real value add. And truth is it helped them fit in the rhythm of their life, right? You can do this on the evenings when you need to, you can do this during midweek when it wouldn't have worked necessarily other times. So it did, it hit in a bunch of different areas. It really kind of had that impact. I love that. Uh, if you want to ask a question, just go to the management test kitchen. And maybe if we don't get some, we might work with Blue to try and get them answered later. Uh, Blue, this one here just came in. We've got uh, Chris and Eugene. He said, uh, you talked before about, uh, you know, the balance between personal development and short-term yeah. uh, goals. How do you find the balance of employee is going too far on the personal development goals versus yeah. the goals that we need to be hit to help the organization succeed? Love it. So I think part of the structure is what helps keep that in balance or in check, right? So I mentioned that I think in general, and this is just a generality, six to seven goals annually is a good number to kind of track against. I wouldn't go much beyond 10 for sure. We asked our team to split those in half. So that's just one area with it. Now, if a manager was saw an individual that they felt we wanted to develop, they saw a future role for them, then that's where you create the flexibility to say, maybe it's 60, 40. Maybe you shift a little bit for this year and you allow it to kind of push some. What we did is we put some structure around all of it. So I mentioned to you that the alignment goals, they fit within certain categories like our, you know, financial, we call it shareholder value or stewardship in the church world, uh, efficiency, you know, and then member engagement and then staff development. So goals had to fit in that. The development goals we also have categories for. Right. So on our development goals, we look and say, if you're going to develop in these areas, it's going to be around the area of organizational, spiritual development, interpersonal development, leadership. And then uh, the last one is um, positional, something that helps you within your role here. So what we said is it's not just anything. Right. Um, diet probably didn't fit in there in your development. That's your personal scorecard you can go over here. We're going to ask you to develop your professional skills to support the organization. So the balance was split them about 50-50, use that as a starting point, adjust a little bit as you need to, make sure your alignment goals hit one of these kind of four buckets that's in support and make sure your developmental goals hit in one of these five buckets of what we're trying to in, you know, advance in you as a, as a skill set for the organization. So that's where you want 
some flexibility, but putting some structure keeps it from going off the rails right into an area. And I think that's where having a system really helped us rather than just an idea of goal setting, but having some structured goal setting really brought in some of that. Okay, great. That, this is fantastic. I've got a question here that just came in again. Amy asks, if, uh, we tie our goals to annual bonus and compensation, but yeah. a, as a large church whose focus is on discipleship uh, and not numbers, sometimes it's really difficult to find goals or objectives that are actually measurable. It's tough yeah. to quantify life change, for example. Any yep. suggestions or examples that you have on setting goals around more subjective measures? Yeah, I love it. It's actually a great question because I think that same question can apply itself to a general philosophy about church, right? If we're looking for transformational heart at a church, I used to say to people that well, at the end of the day, if we could help somebody's heart transform for Christ through a pill, then we wouldn't do any of this. We'd just go to Walgreens and buy them a pill and we'd be done, right? If that was it, but, but it's not. The other thing is I can't track transformation of heart very well, right? So until you can plug an ethernet cable into somebody's heart and download that they've, they've been transformed, it's very hard to measure that. So we're forced to measure what we consider are steps that create the highest probability of that transformation taking place, right? We just know over the history of 2000 years of church that when people do these types of things, the probability of that change of heart goes way up. So when they attend corporate worship, when they, you know, get into a small group ministry, when they serve other people, when they give of their resources. These are things that tend to actually create opportunities for that. So I don't want, I, I know I'm probably repeating myself, but it's because I don't want to be dismissive to say that it's the act that's important. It's the result of the act. I just can't measure the results. So I measure the act for now. So what we did is we actually broke the steps down and started measuring them. And literally one of the scorecard elements we had was how many next steps did collectively the people in our church take? If last year we had X, how many people this year, Y did we get to get in a small group? Did we move that number? Right now, I can't guarantee that that small group had the impact we're looking for, but I know that we believe it does. So we want them involved in it. How many people weren't giving last year and we increased net new givers by, and I can measure those. So we actually put in part of our goal setting movement of the steps that people take. So one of our goals was very specifically, and we changed these by year, was to increase our baptisms, which is a step you know, towards that transformation of heart. And so that allowed everybody to say, okay, if that's going to be a focus for this year, if we're really going to lean in, what we're actually going to track are the number of people who were baptized, right? A small group is a trend. We're going to track the number of people that were not in small group last year and got into small group this year. And we're going to set a numeric goal based on that. We want to increase it by 42% from last year. What does that number equal? And that then becomes the, the goal number or the metric that you measure by. So hey, I on get this, it, do it. On this point, I mean, uh, you had you, at CCV, you actually emphasized, uh, was it baptisms? And, and yeah. would you just talk us through, I mean, as an organization, you emphasized it, it flowed down into individual goals and it, from, I think we, we talked about this, you hit the, the goal that you had, but then there was a downside that happened. What, what happened there? Yeah, so what we did is we look at these goals, right? And we have a, a very set number of kind of steps. And very specifically, we just targeted seven steps of discipleship for people, right? It was, it was baptism or what we call just a commitment, a commitment to Christ. And then you have attending church, worship, connect in small group, give, serve, share your faith, and then lead other people. So those are kind of the seven steps. And what we would do is each year is look at how we were doing with regards to those steps. And just, you know, by, by the nature of human nature of where you're at, you're going to lean into one or another. So measuring it allows us to say, ooh, we may be neglecting something, right? Or just because we ended up our preaching schedule or, or you know, just some of the activities that we produced had an unintentional or an unintentional impact on a certain number. So looking at them, we could say, okay, for this year, we need to shift that and lean into one or another. So we would look at the numbers to determine what we want to set. Then in this goal setting, we would find those ones that we are neglecting. And as you mentioned, for instance, we said, hey, baptism is an area we really want to focus on. So for two years, we focused on it. And very specifically, what it said is, hey, we're going to preach from it from the stage. Our ministries, we're going to create different programmatic or teaching content around it. Then all of a sudden, we just created all this unleashed idea, you know, what uh, team members came up with, not, not executive team, but what staff came up with. And 
One was, hey, how do I create short videos for people to baptize others, right? So, you, so that they can become part of the holy priesthood and baptizing people. So then they created content to help people do baptisms in their home. And then our technology team had to create a way for them to upload that that baptism took place, right? And upload pictures. So it just unleashed this whole idea of creating programs and products and tools around supporting baptism. We ran that for two years with heavy emphasis and, and saw 40% growth in baptisms one year. And I think 46 in the second wow. year. And it, it's not that you, that you don't keep doing that. We always still talk about baptism, but in the third year, we realized that we had swung a little bit and neglected some other areas. So we chose that year annually to push into these other areas and included things like giving for one point and small group ministry. And we saw that our baptisms went from 40% growth, 46% growth to a negative 4%, right? And so what happened is just because of this inertia and this guidance, we realized that you really can move the needle. So what we, you know, in the subsequent year was realized we can't put all our energy in that. You still have to focus some on all of the steps of engagement. But if you focus too heavily, you can actually have a negative impact and drop down on one. What I found from that is a positive, maybe I'm just, you know, the optimist, is that it's working, right? When we unleash the energy, when we put people guided towards it, it actually moves the needle and has an impact on it. So we just learned over time how to use this tool to make sure that we didn't have negative impact, but we kept things balanced. Would you, uh, I mean... As someone who's been through this before, you've seen, you know, hey, you just look at that and you say, wow, really just we swung the pendulum, we swung it back a bit more, yeah. we found a balance. Would you just speak to the leader out there who kind of looks at that and says, yeah, like last year we were up 30% of baptisms, this year we're minus 4%. How yeah. did you deal with not getting demoralized? Because, you know, if this yeah. is what we're about as an organization is, you know, uh, is baptism, yeah. And we, we kind of swing it like this and we say, ah, like actually now I've gone too far this way. Like how did, yeah. how did you and the executive team not get demoralized by seeing the number go down that far? Yeah. Well, part of it is, and, and this is what I love about it, is we look at an entire, what I'll call the member life cycle, right? So it's, we are highly evangelical. There's no doubt about it. But we also know that by creating disciples, what we do is unleash a whole bunch of disciple makers, right? A whole bunch of evangelism. So even though our personal sort of baptism number dropped, what we realized is that we had the ability to create these coaches and it may have cost us a year of learning, but then we unleashed them because the very next year went right back up again. So the, the way to not be demoralized is we realized that we're, we're not trying to fix everything in a day. We're getting smarter and we're getting better and hopefully more organized and more understood so that we can run the play for a long, long time, right? We're not, we're looking at this over a a pretty broad horizon. So part of it was one, even though we lost some numbers in baptism, we had a significant growth in other areas. In one area, we saw 137% increase because we focused on it, right? What we realized was that's a huge win to get 137%. We don't want it to ever come at a negative in this area. So maybe we push a little less and we just know that the next year, our emphasis might be a little more balanced. So I know I'm I maybe, I'm not sure, I want to make sure I'm answering your question, but we did it because we were excited about the ability to move the needle and understand more than we were what was happening in each one of the micro, uh, you know, steps that we were taking. No, I love that. I mean, obviously it's a little off topic here for goal yeah. setting, but I think what I'm hearing you say is you step back and you looked at the whole picture and you said, look, in this one area, we did swing it too far. We're going to yeah. correct that. But actually, yeah. there's some incredible life change that's happening across the organization that we should be right. really proud of. And that yep. allows yep. us to not get demoralized when we feel like, you know, we've made a mistake or a misstep. There's actually yeah. usually a lot of other good things happening across the organization. I just I just wanted to deep dive on that a little bit. You know what it is? It's just two pieces that one, we are moving the needle elsewhere and that keeps you going. But two was we were we were getting informed and we felt like we had something to help us make decisions. What I always said as a leader is I just want to know what lever to pull. Right. I don't want it to just guess. I don't want to just start pulling levers and hope something happens. And then I really have no ideas. I wanted to some informed decision making. Right. So what we felt like is this gave us more insight into levers we can pull. We may have pulled this one a little too far, but at least we're insightful now. We understand it. We can pull it back. I would say for years previously, and there's a lot of organizations out there, they're winging it. If we're being honest as leaders is you're you're making a decision and intuition is a great thing. I think it's God given. But at the end of the day, I want to marry my intuition with some data and some information. And I want those two things to come together because I think it makes me at least a better decision maker when I can marry both of those things. When it was all intuition driven, 
we just didn't know, right? We'd have to wait for the outcome to see. Now we just are better informed. So yeah, there's other things that are helping that kept us, you know, the motivation high and the fact that we were getting better kept our motivation high. Those two things, we'd play into each other. I love that. That is so great. So uh, on that topic, uh, here's a question from uh, Dan from Barry. He says, uh, how do you think about goal setting, you know, leading indicators versus lagging indicators? I've got some strong beliefs on this one, but I'd love to hear. Why don't you go first on that one and I'll chime in. (laughs) Well, uh, I used to be very much in the, in the, um, the camp of focusing on outcomes and outputs. And I think uh, as leaders, we, we need to focus on outcomes because it really, those are the things that move the needle. Um, but I think there's a challenge in over-indexing on outcomes that actually you can enroll people's mind, but not their heart, because I'm coming yeah. to work, hit a number and I'm hitting a number and maybe I'm even hitting the number, but I've left this whole other part of uh, my, uh, my being behind just to focus on, I'm just, I'm just a cog in a wheel. We can be too over-indexed on, on numbers. Yeah. And so now I think there's a way to think about this, which is if we can set goals that are, are leading and yeah. we can focus on kind of doing the right things, you know? So like we say, well, we want people to buy more stuff or we want more people to be baptized. Well, one of the ways we can do that is look at these leading indicators that are actually kind of more engaging with the heart. How do we engage yep. people? How do we help people to bring this heart position to work? And it's yeah. about doing the right thing. And if we do the right thing often enough, then the outcomes are going to take care of themselves. And there's, there's a yeah. great book um, by Bill Walsh called The School Takes Care of Itself. And it's yeah. actually really focused on this. I mean, funny story. He, um, when he joined the 49ers, uh, instead of trying to hire players and, and you know, yeah. start recruiting a quarterback, the first thing he did was he sat down with the receptionist and taught her how to answer the phone yeah, and said, look, right. this, this is who we are as an organization. This is how we yeah. carry ourselves. And this is what we're going to do. And I think sometimes you can get to the end goal, but you yeah. can actually you know, cause a lot of damage or you can get there through hacks and other things that end up actually putting your organization in a worst position in the long term and that's what i love about what you said is you you didn't hit the goal you know or you found you'd swung it too far the other way uh but actually there were some good things happening sometimes it's you know if you hit the goal but actually you have a lot of bad things happening that can be a worse position to be in so you uh, know we talked last time you're talking about that that you know we have this idea of what i just call our core four our vision our mission our values and our strategy and this is sort of what what we operate by and then you have these outcomes it's the part in the middle that's most important to me. What are the actions we're going to do with the desire of the outcomes? It's not the outcomes. It's the action in between that we're going to try to align and do. So I'm a big believer at there was a fundamental shift that I had, even, even within the uh, use of the balance scorecard. I, I sound like I'm over advocating for them. I've just, that's what I've used for 30 years. And so it's very comfortable, but within it, that it's not about the outcomes. The outcomes that you have are an output of the actions that you put in place and they just happen. So a lot of people, What's interesting, say we're going to set goals in this. So, for instance, financial or stewardship in church, that bucket and the balance scorecard, it's shifted for us to say that's actually going to be a metric that says if we're doing what we're supposed to do, that will come out. And so it's an indice for us about whether our actions are aligned or not. It's really not about that, because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is implement the concept of giving as a spiritual discipline within the church. Giving just happens, the numbers happens to be an output from it. Now, it's a resource the church needs to operate, et cetera, but it's not about that. I could go to a bank and borrow money and get that number if we needed to. It's not about that. It's about the spiritual discipline. And if we have that number, it means we've opened up that receptivity to a number of people. So we change those outcomes. And I think I'm repeating exactly what you said to be natural outputs if we're doing what we're supposed to do right, if we're doing it well. So that is a little bit of a different mindset that I subscribe to 100%. I love that. Uh, another question uh, I'm just picking up here is um, how do you uh, encourage reflection after a review period? So, uh, you know, let's say at the end of the year, we sit down, yeah. we have a conversation, but how do you kind of systematize the learnings? Is there a specific way that you do reviews? Um, yeah. any, any, how, do, how do performance reviews feed into goals? Yeah, that's great. So even just the rhythm of of the year a little bit for us does this. As I mentioned, you know, we kind of close out one year and why we're doing that in Q4 of closing out one year, we're kicking off the following year. That's usually at a corporate level we go through. Part of the annual planning, we tie in also our budget 
and then any sort of end of year evaluation. So the end of year eval is part of this area where you sit down and if there are any sort of variable compensation that are tied to it, that's when those discussions take place. And then we capture sort of what our success rate was, that, that hit rate you were talking about accomplishing the goals. And then we can start adjusting for next year, whether we're a little too hot or a little too light, were we sandbagging, were we not? So it certainly impacts kind of what you're doing the next one. But at a structured level, one of the things that we implemented we had a small department and I'm going to say we were fortunate enough to be able to have this, which was focused just on our staff development. Mm. And they would review those goals then and say, hey, here's certain areas. The same way I would say as an organization, we're leaning too hard into, into stewardship. We need to do more efficiency or and from efficiency, we need to look at, you know, member engagement. Same way I would look at that. They would look at what was important to us to have balanced skill sets within our staff. And so then they would start to track and say, hey, listen, within leadership, we had zero goals, right? We had 2% that were in the interpersonal area of the development. And so what we realized is we need to balance that out more. And then we can start encouraging with the directors, hey, on the developmental goals, not just the alignment, but then on the developmental goals, we can lean a little bit further. That actually guided what we taught on for the year. So I mentioned to you, we meet as a staff. We have 12, one a month staff development. Two of them are dedicated to planning. Some areas that left 10 that were purely instructional. We would then set the agenda for those 10 based on a certain area that we felt we needed to dive into. Fantastic. Uh, and a question that comes off the back of that then is, um, do you make the goals transparent? Uh, is, hmm. is it uh, shared across teams and organization level? Yeah, that's a great call. So our obviously our executive initiatives are very transparent. We publish those, the entire organization, we, we go out, we teach on it, right? And roll that out to the staff. The department goals within the system are seen as well. So anybody who logs in can look at what each of the departments are so we can make sure that we're aligned. The individual goals are shared purely between the individual and their director. And that primarily because we wanted them to have the comfort and the confidence on that developmental side to be able to say, hey, here's areas of personal development I'd like to raise my hand and say I'd like to push into, or vice versa, a director may say, I think this is an area that would benefit you if we leaned into this year to keep you sort of engaged and productive. So the individual ones were not shared across the organization. That was just the individual and their supervisor. And then obviously our staff development team, and which is part of the HR team um, that would look at it. But the other two, the, the executive initiatives and then the department uh, objectives, those were transparent for everybody in the organization. Great. Okay, here's a question. Uh, this is from Roger in Seattle. He says, uh, coaching, coaching people who already have goals and uh, yeah. some kind of you know, uh, uh, understanding where they want to go in life is really easy. Uh, but what about people who uh, you know, don't quite know uh, what, their, what their future plans are? You know, yeah. how, do you, how do you help them set goals? Because you know, these development yeah. you know, goals we're trying to set, obviously you know, can be focused on, you know, people's future development. Uh, yeah. But if, you know, maybe this person works with millennials, perhaps I'm not sure, you know, yeah. it's like, Hey, I don't, I don't know where I want to go. Well, you know, I even do this. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, so we, we did a couple things. One was um, when we rolled out the first time, the concept of annual planning, it was brand new. So you got to imagine 400 people sitting in a room, hearing this new initiative, this new, you know, uh, management methodology that we're implementing. We're going to lead the organization by setting annual goals. The new thing I want you to do, uh, you can imagine, I, and at least I do, that several of them are like, another thing, right? Of all my to-do work list, you're going to make me now do this piece of it. So part of it is we got all of the leaders together first, all of the department heads or the ministry leaders, and we sat them in a room and we talked about it. And we made sure we captured input about how they felt and articulated the value of it. We then prepped them also with what I'm going to call sort of a workbook. Hey, when you sit down with your team, here's some stuff that we would love for you to reinforce. Here's some questions I think you might have. So some FAQs that we can put together for you. And we just arm them incredibly well to be the front line to answer questions of the naysayers or the whys or how comes we're doing this. So rather than just planning on it being a one time from the stage, this is what you're doing. We reinforce that these department leads are really going to be the drivers behind this, this initiative called annual planning. So we armed them, in my opinion, exceptionally well to go out and be able to be the front line to answer questions and motivate their team, the person they're one-on-one -on -one talking with to drive to it. The other part that I would say is that at the end of the day with this is we're going to ask this of you because it, we also believe that it is an inertia for our organization. So, you know, the, I think it's the old story. We've all heard the analogy that in a boat, there's three types of people, you know, those that are rolling towards a goal, 
those who are just sitting down kind of playing on their phone while somebody else is rowing and the other guys who are dropping an anchor or rowing backwards or being naysayers, punching holes in the boat. What this allowed us to do very transparently is if we had hole punchers, backwards rowers, this wasn't a fit for them within our organization. This is, this is a philosophy of ours. I, I deem that as a win and it helped us uncover people who were anti, who were naysayers. And so that did allowed that, us to- Did that, that really point. happen? It really did. Yeah, we had, so not a lot, but we, I would say yeah. that in any organization at any rhythm of time, you're going to have- five percent or so depending on the size of your organization that because of what's going on in their life they're just there right and and you know this is now we're, we're tangenting a little bit this is just my belief but i think every couple of years that you see about a five percent turnover is a healthy thing it's the pruning process things happen throughout life where it's no longer a fit and so i when i go would go into an organization from a due diligence perspective in my old bc world if I saw an attrition rate that was above 5%, it gave me some pause. What's going on here? Is there some unhealth? If I saw it below 5%, it was an indication of apathy for me. I, you know, there's people punching holes in the boat. I'm just not willing to do something about it, right? So I usually use that as a rough metric of, huh, what should I be looking at? What's the health of it this? Depends on the part of the country too. Just, I mean, I mean some, totally. like, I, spent, I lived in Seattle and the turnover rate was a lot higher because of because cost of living, you know, people, right. especially in industry, people are getting recruited all the time. So, but yeah, as Got a it. guideline, exactly. Sorry, Karen. Well, on. and please, you know, I hesitate even throwing those numbers out because I give myself a lot of grace in that. It's just a, a quick little yep. on a piece of paper guideline for me to look at, but areas, regions, industries are different. Tech industry has a much higher turnover traditionally, right? Other areas. So it's a very rough guideline, but the point is it's okay to look at and understand that you're going to have somebody who it's no longer fit for them to be at that organization. And our job with respect and dignity is to address that. And I think this process can help uncover some of that, right? And allows you to have that conversation. The goal then would be really the area that we focus on are the people who are not rowing right now. And this initiative allowed us to have a conversation to say, hey, we're just not that type of organization uh, where apathy or just being here is enough. We want, well, especially in the church world, what we're doing, what we're striving for requires us to put our best effort forward and it requires us all to row in the right direction. So for me, it was, especially within the context of, of work, it was uh, somewhat of a non-negotiable. It was a way to help people understand we need to do this. I, you've got me on, if you have individuals, call it a younger generation that doesn't see the value of goal setting, um, I think that's probably a longer conversation. Personally, I, I don't, I'm not sure I have the right answer on how to, how to address that. I would always go through and just explain from a personal level the value it's had for me as an individual. Throughout life, throughout work, throughout career, um, I can point to, and only with the benefit of hindsight, how having a plan and the grace to allow myself to adjust the plan was a critical component of any success I may have had. Absolutely. I could not agree any higher with that. I mean, have, having a plan is, is critical. Um, uh, I think as General Patton said, uh, a good plan violently executed today is better yeah. than uh, an average plan, you know, executed at some indeterminate point in the future. So yeah. having a well, plan I, is. Yeah, that's a great point. I used to always say, actually, and this is also just a philosophers that I want to have 80% confidence in the plan and move forward. If I wait for us to have 100% confidence, we'll have missed the error that we wanted to roll this thing out. So that was just one that allowed our folks to take some risk, to understand that there is some uncertainty around this. We know that we're using our best guess, our best intelligence to make the plan. Let's be 80% confident. Like, I think this is the right plan with an 80% nice CF confidence factor. And let's move forward rather than waiting. If it's under 80%, Oh, I probably need to dive in a little bit more. I'm not that great of a risk taker. Some guys will tell you 50%, right? I've, I've seen that in some areas. I'm, I think Colin Powell said somewhere with the army, anything above that, you got to make it up in the field anyway. So he was sort of a 50% guy. I'm more of an 80% confidence and let's rock and roll. We talked before about the sandbaggers, you know, people trying to, you know, choose some goals that were too easy. Uh, did you ever have some people who tried to take on too much and just say, look, give me more, give me more, give me more. And then they come in, you know, at half of the goals because they tried to take on way more than they could handle. Yeah, I think I, you know, and, and I don't know even at the church world that I would say I saw, uh, you know, too much of that, but certainly within some of my other areas, especially when compensation was tied too highly to it, 
Then you saw people that felt if I took on more, that might have an impact on my bonus or a variable component, et cetera. And so we actually even changed our comp plans to an area to where um, we compensated you the more accurate you hit your goals, not the more goals you accomplished, right? So you don't get more money because you got 10 goals versus the guy who has five. But if you estimated and you were pretty good in your estimating, you don't get money because you sandbag and you hit it. If you said, I'm going to bring in five and you brought in 10, that doesn't get you necessarily more because that mm. didn't allow me to plan, right? But if you said 10 and you were within a plus or minus of that within, you know, 10% in either direction, that had a higher uh, degree of compensation for it because I wanted to be able to plan. I wanted to be able to just resource appropriately, hire the right people, staff up when we need to. So we changed our metric from more is good to more accurate is good. So that helped us a little bit in that area. Fantastic. Flu, last question before we get into the sure. cookfire here. How did you review uh, the kind of uh, the team goals before they got approved? Did someone... Did the manager's manager take a final look at those individual goals or did it, yeah. was it just like, Hey, we trust you, you know, good job. No, they, they reviewed and approved those. And, and again, even in the system that we use, so we used a computer, you know, a software system to bet with the balance scorecard and it literally had an, an author role and it had an editor role, which was their manager. And he had to approve it before it went to live. So even if I wanted to go in and see a summary of the department goals, if they were in process in editing mode, they weren't finalized and I didn't see them. So very much so we followed it up. And that was because we leaned heavily into the directors to say, you're our aligners, right? If we have individual goals that aren't aligning with your department goals, I've already done that with you, made sure the departments are aligned with the executive. But if you haven't done the same thing to make sure the individuals align with the department goals, then we're going to be off in, in the wrong part. So very much so were those approved by the department head. They then also felt some ownership for it. Like my employees' success is slightly dependent on my ability to work with them to help them accomplish this. I've signed off on it. I've approved this direction. But from my perspective, it helped to just reinforce that we want alignment is one of our biggest initiatives we're trying to get out of this thing. So yeah, there was an approval process for sure. And then they went through and reviewed it with them. Fantastic. All right, let's jump into our quick fire segment where we get to hear some uh, some wise words in, in a short space of time. Love it. Uh, Blue, what is the most impactful leadership book that you've ever read? Good to great is probably the most impactful book if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna have me go all the way back. Um, of late, I thoroughly enjoyed Grit by Angela Duckworth. It's one that's sort of this idea, can you measure a gritty organization? How big of an impact? Uh, you know, we've, we've evolved as, to know that, that IQ is subordinate to EQ, but they're even starting to show that EQ is subordinate to grit. I'm just a huge believer. Get it done, buddy. So that book is one I've handed out to several people. Fantastic. Couldn't agree more on both of them. Uh, if you could use one word to describe your leadership style, what would it be? Strategy. And I know that sounds crazy, but I think there's hierarchical leadership, there's organizational leadership, uh, and then there's strategic leadership. I spend an, a disproportionate amount of time on my strategy because I think it enables people who are way smarter than me to execute. So I would say that that is mine. It's strategy and clarity. If you had to ask me kind of the top things, it's have a plan, make sure it's really clearly understood, easy to follow, simple to, to act against, and unleash the organization to go get it. I can correct people along the way, right? We can make little shifts, but I want everybody running. And so I would say strategic leadership is probably the cornerstone of my style of leadership. Is, is that something you learned or something that you, uh, you know, kind of always knew to some degree? No, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, I don't, it's probably a little bit of both if I'm being honest, right? As you go through and certainly some of my experience growing up pointed to it. I remember being one time as a young, I was an intern with a German company and I'm over there in Germany. And, and at some point there was a guy, I think was, he was reading the paper all day. That was his job. And I finally built up the courage to ask my boss, like, what, what's his job? All I see him do is read the paper all day. And and because of, of tax incentives and other things, it was cheaper for the organization to keep the guy than let him go. And I just remember having this profound impact on me that I never wanted somebody to feel that, to feel burdened of just sitting there, right? How do we get somebody so they feel like they're contributing in a meaningful way to the direction that goes all the way down the organization everywhere. So that taught me first sort of the philosophy of engaged. And then I started looking at like, how do I get people engaged? How do I unleash that? How do I open that up? And and I'm just really, really grateful to mentors ahead of me, right, throughout the organization that have really pushed that. I, 
you know, had a question one time at some point, and this was back in my auto days when I was with Daimler, where I was, uh, I was talking with my guys and he was talking about the dealers, right? And, and I thought we knew better. We're at headquarters and I'm talking a little bit, um, you know, belittling of the dealer network and these are used car dealers or car dealers. So I thought it was funny where we were and he paused for a moment and he said, they're the ones who are talking to the customer. They've got a better understanding of what's going on than we ever will, right? At some point we can come up with the best product, but if that product isn't distributed to the customer, in an incredibly powerful way, then we're no good. Our job is to make sure they're resourced, they're informed, they understand so they can go deliver the product. I remember it hit me like, yeah, there's skills that these guys have and there's connections that I'll never have. I got to figure out a way how to unleash that and rally it. So I feel it, but I'm going to tell you, I was really, really grateful for people ahead of me to do that. That was not rapid fire. You're going to have to cut me off more. <laughs> no, no, that was fantastic. It was worth the price of admission. Uh, okay, number three. Tell us yep. about your biggest distraction working from home. Oh, that's great. Uh, my backyard. I like to <laughs> mow my own grass. I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but I look out from my office window working from home and all I can think about is watering or grass or something. There's uh, there is something about the outdoors for me. I get rejuvenated. I breathe a little deeper. I think a little better. Um, the problem is, is I could probably work from my lawnmower at times, but that's probably my biggest distraction. Well, you're in Arizona, so that lawn needs plenty of care. It gets it, right? You can do year round. You know, it, it's funny you say that. For years, I'd work from home, and this is a bonus material or unsolicited. I think this is this is some of the new norm, right, where we're at with this. I've worked from home and an office for better part of the last 15 years, right, of commuting where we are. And I think there's certain rhythms that I put in place early on that benefit me. Uh, most of my children are grown now, right? Three of the four are out of the house and grown, but even when they're here, I kiss them goodbye to go to my office in my home, right? And they just realize this is work time. Um, I had a dedicated area where I could, where I could work from. Um, it allowed me to get focused and everybody knew that. So there were just certain disciplines I think that one can put in place. And they've served me well. So I feel actually very comfortable working from home. <laughs> On episode one of our podcast, yeah. um, William Vanderblomen was telling me about his friend who put a separate key card access to his office. <laughs> in his home. <laughs> That's great. How much does that cost? I wonder. All right. I don't know. Uh, question four. Tell us about your biggest failure. Ooh, goodness. And now you're asking me to expose a whole bunch of this area. Um, I think I was a young manager. I, I, and honestly, you didn't give me time to prep from this one. So I'm, so I'm going through this. I'd just been promoted. This is in the digital advertising space. Um, in my young 30s, and I was given more responsibility than I should have had. And I went in and I think that I wanted to really exert my leadership dominion. And so I moved some people out of offices, took the bigger office, did all of these things that I thought were representative of the guy who was in charge. And it had a massive backlash on me. Right. Mm. At some point, people saw this as land grabbing and ill-informed. And I look back on it now and I would have thumped myself in the forehead if I had seen some of this. But I lost a lot of respect to the people who were working for me that I already had. Right. They saw me growing through the ranks and working hard. And I think I'd earned their respect. And then when given the role, I thought I had to change my demeanor. Right. In some area. And that was really when I look back sort of in a holistic, not an individual moment, but there were a series of things I did that were uncharacteristic of who I am. And so I've just learned that no matter where we're at, there's some essentials for me as an individual. And one of them is the get stuff done, right? And I don't, I don't mean to be looting your podcast, but I had a coffee cup that said it on it because I used to do all the time that no matter where I'm at, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to get some stuff done. I've got to set some goal. I'm going to honor the people below me. I'm going to try to elevate the dignity of everybody who works for me, right? At some point, demeaning does me no value. I want them to rise. I've learned over time that when both the dignity and the effort and the outcome of the people around me rise, I rise right along with them. Um, probably my biggest failure in learning was to be able to learn to do that for people. I love that. Okay, last question and sure. take a little longer if you need to, but uh, tell us about a time someone believed in you when perhaps they shouldn't have. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> um. Yeah, boy, there's a, there's, there's 10 different directions. I want to go with this one and without sounding too sappy, my wife, right? At some point or another, the one person who knows me better than anybody is my wife, right? And uh, there was a time, and I think I mentioned this, where I was um, traveling an enormous amount, right? When I was in the, the advertising space, not only did I travel for clients, 
My home office was Phoenix. My workspace was LA. So I commuted daily to LA, right? I got up in the morning, flew out and came back. Stupid. Um, as we decided to make a change for life, right? What are we going to do with this? Are we going to quit? It was the first time in my life um, that I decided to stop doing something without having the next thing completely planned, right? It was a full faith uh, that God would provide. She knew that. But honestly, after I resigned and I flew home, and I'm not sure if this was me just being spiteful or where we were, but I swung by Lowe's on our way home, bought a for sale by owner, and I came out and stuck this sign in our yard as a little bit of saying, we may have to sell our home, right? We may have to do these things with it. And all she did was walk out, give me a kiss on the cheek, rub my back and head back in the house. Like, I got you. I don't care where we are, what we do. Has had more faith in me being able to provide than, than I probably deserve at some point or another. So the wife is for sure on a personal front, the one that supported me the most. Um, from a business perspective, uh, it, it, it definitely was um, in my Daimler world, right? So we were launching a, uh, a new product it was called the M-Class. It's the first vehicle being built outside of Germany in a new plant. The first one outside of it this years ago. So I'm dating myself, but I was, I was fresh out of grad school. And when I came in, they uh, asked me to help manage the press that would come in from all around the world to kind of view the launch of this vehicle. In the auto space, it's a pretty big deal. And I remember looking at the guy and saying, I, I don't even know what I'm doing. I mean, like I'm fresh out of grad school. And I appreciate him saying, hey, listen, I know you don't know. That's why you're here. You're going to learn. But you have the raw material and I'll be right by your side. Ask a thousand questions. If you don't ask, you're going to get it wrong. Ask and I'll help you do it. And the learning from this is going to be threefold. I've stuck with that forever. That was a great, a really, I'm really appreciative of him, him trusting me like that. Well, let me ask you for one bonus round here, if I can. Yeah. I mean, you've obviously been phenomenally successful. You know, you've been an executive pastor at CCV, uh, you know, successful VC, you know, successful executive. I think the one thing we all struggle with, especially in today's world is just work-life balance. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, uh, give, give, give us some advice or some advice you would give to your younger self on yeah. how to balance all of these things. Because I know that, you know, at various mm -hmm. times you've been on one end of the spectrum and then other times on the other, sure, but sure. you know, it's not something I struggle with. We, we all struggle with. And, yeah. um, I know that you you're a very intentional uh, guy, and you you know you've done some things to try and find that balance. But like today, mm -hmm. it feels like you've got you've got that in a really good place. Um, but would love Thank to hear you. you know advice to other leaders out there, senior pastors, people who are struggling yeah. with trying to achieve you know the all of these goals they've got to achieve, but at the yeah. same time they don't want to sacrifice their family. How how do you how did you do that? You know, and, and yeah. what advice would you have for folks? So it obviously took me a while to even get there. I appreciate you saying that because there was a time when it was out of whack. And, and in fact, you know, quitting the digital agency uh, world was a huge, uh, you know, rubber band shoot back from, from not being in balance for a while. So for me, and it really ties in with what we're talking about today, I have to be really structured, very intentional about it. It doesn't come natural. My natural instinct is to go a thousand miles an hour in one direction towards a goal. I have to be intentional. So a couple of things that I did is I, I mentioned it earlier, this balance scorecard for life. Balanced part of that, even in a business set, remember was you don't lean into one direction too heavily. Well, for life, I did the same thing. I have my professional bucket, but I also have my family bucket. I have my spiritual and personal health bucket. Right? I have, so I have these buckets that are important to me. And first was determining what's important to me, right? Marriage and my family is an important component. As much as it is, I have to earn an income because you got to make a living and you got to come in and my health, I want to be able to, to do things as we go through this. So all these were important. I first determined my buckets and then I set three goals for each bucket annually and I hold myself and invite others to hold me accountable to it. So I have a group of men that I meet with and then obviously my wife and our family, I present them both with my balance scorecard and I ask them, please hold me accountable to this. So we meet on a regular basis. We go through the scorecard the same way I would as an employee with my boss about where my goals are. I give them my, my, you know, balance scorecard for life and they'll check on it. Like, Hey, you have on here that might be workout three times a week. Are you doing that? Right. Part of one of my goals this year was to get back into nature. Uh, I do. I talk about mowing my lawn, but truth is I get out in the woods and there's something about it that's rejuvenating and I'll have some metrics on there on the frequency in which I want to get in. They'll hold me accountable. So I have to be really structured mindset works for a while. And then I get in the rhythm of life and you just start going and you can forget that. So I write it down. 
I give it to groups of people, my wife, and then a set of accountable guys, and I ask them to hold me accountable to it. It's the only way that I've found to keep that going in a consistent basis time over time. The other thing that I would say is there really is this idea of having perfect balance, I think is a myth, right? I may get hate mail from a bunch of authors out there right now, but I think life has a little bit of ebb and flow to it. You have some peaks, you have some valleys. And what I do is I try not to go too far in either direction of those. And I just know that I set expectations clearly with the people who are close to me that this is a rhythm of life where we're gonna go a little hotter this is a rhythm of life where we're going to go a little lighter and we'll have some more margin. And then I just make sure that they're not caught off guard with it. I love that. That is, that is incredible. Uh, and one tactical thing, which you did is you move really close to your, uh, to where you work. So you don't have a commute. I've, I've done the same thing. I mean, if you're yeah. uh, blessed to be in a position to do that, that helps a lot because that's another half hour to an hour a day. <laughs> well, it's so funny you say that. I mean, there, and then it's also, I know triggers that work on me emotionally and for whatever reason, traffic, I'd rather be waterboarded. I think than sit in traffic, right? It just, it, it, it's, it's insane to me. So I've just have really tried to be incredibly intentional about either where, you know, I work and live, if you have the ability to do that or the time of day by which I commute so that I can avoid these triggers that just make me a miserable human being. It's I love that so much. Blue, this has been phenomenal, phenomenal advice. Uh, I know there's so many leaders out there who are going to benefit from hearing uh, how to structure goals at an organizational level and then at an individual level um tell us just give us uh, 30 seconds about what you're up to now where people can find more about you um yeah. and then you know i would love if if you're up for it if people uh, post additional questions on this maybe we can i sure. uh, get a couple of answers posted to the uh, management test kitchen as well yeah, absolutely be happy to do that i just want to say thank you also for doing this you know you and i have bumped into each other and for a couple of years now across the board and i've just appreciated your advice your counsel you would be one of those guys where you talk about who can you lean into for ideas you're one of those guys. So thank you for even inviting me onto this. I, I genuinely appreciate it and certainly have a ton of respect for you and what you're doing out there. So thank you. Um, right now, I've started a, an organization called The Studio C. Um, I think I mentioned to you that, that while I was at CCB, we started a department called The Studio and it was really focused on saying, hey, how are we intentional about helping people through this life cycle, this journey of theirs from not yet Christian to all the way down? and. And how can we you know, know more about where they are? How can we match them to a potential next step intelligently? And how do we communicate to them personally, relevant and personally? And, and I just uh, credit that to a lot of the, the success and energy that we had going for a while. And I just believe that it's a philosophy and a tool set that serves the Big C Church as well. So literally that's where Studio came, came from. It was the studio team for the Big C Church, Studio C. Uh, I've got a group of people and we're just out there trying to help other churches with this idea of knowing that there's a life cycle and helping people through it. So if they want to learn more, you can either email me at blue at the studio C.org, or you can go to the studio C.org website and submit a form there as well. But whether it's related to member engagement or leadership or whatever that might be, be happy to jump on a phone and talk with folks. Wonderful. Well, Blue, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real privilege and a treat. And uh, we will have you back again on the podcast shortly. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it, bud. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for on this week's episode of Principles in Practice. Thanks for listening in, and we'll see you next time. Make sure that you like and subscribe to stay up to date on all of our new content. And don't forget to check out the description for more information on Blue and his organization. If you had questions for Blue this week that we didn't get a chance to answer, check out our Management Test Kitchen online community. If you haven't already joined the community, it's free. And if you just go to recipes.leader.com and you post your questions there, we'll try and get those over to Blue to get those answered. We're looking forward to seeing you next time.